No, no, no. I, I'm going to in, yeah. Ooh. Good afternoon. So it's my pleasure to welcome you to the NHLI Athena Lecture and to thank you all for coming today. Obviously, fantastic turnout because we've got amazing speakers. So, and I'd like to say to our speakers that everyone is here from Imperial and beyond because we think what you're doing is important and we really value it. I know that the activities that you're going to talk about today are things that you do in addition to seriously pursuing your scientific careers and your studies. And judging by the times that I get emails and tweets from you, very, very often you're doing these things in the dead of night or the early hours of the morning. We recognize and respect your commitment to these endeavors. I think they will play a key role in reshaping the scientific community for the future, for the better, and ensuring that scientific careers are truly for all. So I'd now like to hand over to one of our younger members of the department, Dr. Mike Cox, who is going to facilitate the event from here on in. Mike is a microbial ecologist. Ooh. <laughs> and he's a postdoc in the genomic medicine um, section at NHLI. Um, and he's been with us for eight years. So he's also been a very active member of our Athena Swan Committee. And with Helen Johnson, who is our comms person, last year they established SheNote Speaker, promoting the visibility of women in respiratory, cardiology, vascular and critical care research. So it currently has over 200 members from 23 countries and with another 40 added in the last month. So, Dr. Mike Cox. Thanks very much, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. So, um, it's a pleasure to be able to introduce our speakers. Um, we're, we're in for some great talks. I've had a sneak preview of some of them. Um, we'll have questions at the end after all three talks. Um, so, if you could, you could jot your questions down for the earlier speakers, that would be brilliant. Um, so, it just leaves me to introduce our first speaker who is uh, Dr. Jess Wade. She's a research associate in the uh, Department of Physics, um, working in experimental solid state physics. Um, she completed her master's and PhD at Imperial and has received many awards for her science outreach and work in inclusion and diversity. Most recently, these have included the Institute of Physics Daphne Jackson Medal and prize for acting as an internationally recognized ambassador for STEM. And she was also one of nature's 10 people who mattered in science in 2018. To promote women and minority groups in STEM, uh, Dr. Wade has contributed over 450 articles on notable women scientists and engineers to Wikipedia, gaining an honorable mention as a Wikimedian of the year from founder Jimmy Whale. Jess. Thank you so much. One second. It's going to happen. As you can tell, I like Imperial a lot. I've stayed here for a long time. And now HDMI is selected, and it is not playing. But I can make it happen, because it was happening before. One second. <laughs> I, I can see that, but it's not on that one. Do we mind? It was definitely on that one earlier. Oh, what luck is this? Help. <laughs> okay. Does this one? Okay, well, I'm just going to start. Are we okay with it on one? Okay, thank you, and thank you for having me, and thank you for um, introducing me so kindly there, Mike. Do we, I, I go, right? Okay, great. So, um, yeah, I'm Jess, and I'm going to talk to you today about the work that I've done particularly to better celebrate women scientists. I think that it's no surprise to anyone that science has a problem recruiting and, and retaining women, 
But I don't want to talk so much about recruitment because I don't think that's a massive problem. If you look at A-level physics, if you look at the proportion of girls in A-level physics, it's about a fifth. We actually do better than that at Imperial. We have about a quarter of the undergraduates studying physics are women. If you look at something like chemistry, particularly for medicine, we have about half. And when you look at medicine at university, it's also about half. So I don't think this is a recruitment problem from, from an A-level perspective. And I'm not here to tell you that girls need to do more to love science, because I think they love science already. I also don't have the time, energy, or money to fight with the big corporations to challenge the sexist stereotypes that young children face. Things like these ridiculous Tinder eggs. This Gaff ad campaign, I don't know if any of you saw this, but girls got this kind of beautiful social butterfly outfit, and boys got a little scholar where the t-shirt misspells Einstein. Or the new, the new Lego kit where girls get this ridiculous Lego Friends activity where all the Lego characters are one and a half times the size of a normal Lego and can't go in the cool Lego city. And this is something I don't think we can take on. And I also think probably every single person in this room celebrates their teacher and credits their teacher with their original passion and enthusiasm for science, just like Professor Dame Julia Higgins did earlier this summer. But we have a massive problem in this country at retaining and recruiting specialist science teachers. And I don't think that's anything I can change as a postdoc in physics at Imperial. I do think we can do more about the retention part. So this is a now kind of familiar picture of women leaking out of the academic pipeline, whether it's physics or something like medicine. That picture implies that women are failing at science. But I actually think that science is failing women. And so what I've been trying to do over the past kind of year and a half now is trying to think more about how we can celebrate women so that we can keep them there. And academia has a bunch of problems, right? You've probably come across these or encountered it. Things like bullying, sexual harassment, and the uncertain pathways that are now commonplace in academic careers. And I'm sure, and you could argue, that these impact all scientists. So men and women alike, everyone experiences this. But actually, if you're underrepresented to start off with, these things are much, much harder when you try and take them on. And I don't doubt if we ended all of this, diversity would happen naturally, and we wouldn't have to talk about it so much, because things would just happen. At the same time, there are huge psychological battles that women and underrepresented minorities face. There's daily imposter syndrome. There's unconscious bias that holds us back. And I think that we need to get better collectively at calling this out. And we also need really comprehensive shared parental leave packages like the ones that Imperial provides to support mothers and fathers in the workplace. And then there's the very, very conscious bias that women scientists face. There are the male physicists who think it's OK to say that all successful women in physics are only there due to tokenism. There's the fact that women and non-Westerners are much less cited and selected in peer review. Men are much more likely to cite themselves and other men than they are to cite women. And also a huge amount of academic research fund grants go towards men and, and less favorably towards women. Unless, this is really interesting, unless you remind people to evaluate based on the science rather than based on the resume of the person applying. So we have all of this very, very conscious bias that's happening too. And I think, and probably everyone in this room is thinking, actually, we've got this generation now. We've got all these people in the front row. We've got all these really fiery, feisty undergraduates. And they're going to fight. And they're going to say, this isn't good enough. And we can change it. But that's still going to take a really, really long time unless we do something big. A, a study earlier this year found that it would take, for physics publications, 258 years going at the rate we're going at the moment to reach parity. And, and that's just ridiculous. And that frustrates me. This time, about a year and a half ago, I read an incredible book called Inferior by Angela Saini, and I hope lots of you have read it, and she came to speak in this very room, standing right here, which is kind of cool. And, and this is the, the true power of women and, and, how, and the science that shows it. And it really looks at how throughout history, the whole world, including Charles Darwin, have been so determined to show men and women are different. They've looked at an incredibly biased world, and they've taken that bias as a biological inequality. So they've seen all the hardships that women face and thought that that was due to biology rather than the ridiculous things that society places on them. They've come up with all of these stereotypes that for so long have been making boys and girls think they can achieve different things. And the science behind it is really shoddy. And, and Angela questions this in this book. And it has given me this complete passion and voice to be able to communicate this and to take it everywhere I go. And I have taken it everywhere I go. And I've taken it to almost every impressive scientist and engineer that I've met. And I've given them a copy of this book. And I've spoken about it with them. And it's given me a wealth of sources and references to be able to challenge all of this story science, but really crucially, that confidence to be able to call out bad behavior and the inspiration to spend basically all my free time, like Sarah mentioned in the beginning, trying to celebrate and recognize scientists from underrepresented groups.
And it made me think about the way that we see scientists too. So if, if you Google physicists now, this is the wall that you get. Because for so long, history has been written by men, about men, for other men. And I, I think we can change that now. Because even though there aren't many of them, there are actually some really, really incredible women doing physics. And we need to get better at celebrating and recognizing those. And it made me think about this great platform we have, Wikipedia. We have the power now to democratize the stories that we keep and the stories that we tell, right? Wikipedia is completely free to edit. It's accessed 32 million times a day. It's the fifth most popular website in the world. But on the website, only 17% of the biographies are about women. So 17%, so 83% of the time, you're coming up to a man if you're looking on this website. And that's because, just like in academic physics department, about 90% of the editors are white men, mainly in America. And they create content about things that they're interested in. So since the beginning of 2018, I've been creating a Wikipedia page about a scientist or engineer from an underrepresented minority every single day. And it's been an absolutely incredible journey. And I've made about 460 so far. Sorry, I thought that was loading. And these are absolutely incredible scientists and engineers from all different walks of life. People like Dawn Shorganessi, the radio chemist who's discovered five of the super heavy elements in the periodic table. And every single element had its own comprehensive Wikipedia page, not mentioning Dawn or her team at all. And she didn't have one, right? That's pretty crazy. Or Roma Aguaral, who's a physicist turned structural engineer. She became a structural engineer here at Imperial. She studied physics originally at Oxford came here, did structural engineering, was the chief engineer for the Shard, has now written a whole book about structural engineering, which is really, really brilliant. But she's an incredible person and also didn't have a Wikipedia page. Or this is my favorite one, Gladys West, who's an African-American mathematician who was born in the 1930s and started working for the government. And she was really important in GPS, so the early technology behind GPS. And I read about her last month during Black History Month in America, which is kind of early February. And I made this Wikipedia page. And at the time, there was very little information. You couldn't find a photograph of her that you could have access to. Since then, she was voted as one of the BBC Top 100 Women. So that made a huge spike in the number of people who Google her and look at her page. And she was also inducted just a few weeks ago into the US Aircraft Hall of Fame. So she's a really big deal now. And we're hearing about her more. And that's not entirely because she has a Wikipedia page, but it's part of it. It's about giving you access to that person. And I've been nominating these people for prizes because when you learn so much about these formidable women and men, you learn about how much they haven't been celebrated for so long. You're also really, really good at their biography and you can list all of their impressive achievements and citations and things like that very easily. So probably about once a month, I'll nominate one of these Wikipedia people for a prize. And, and I've got really, really good at writing prize nominations. People started winning really impressive things. And that's a pretty cool thing to do, too. And then, and then since about the midsummer, someone from The Guardian came in and said, can I write an article about your Wikipedia stuff? And before then, until about June, no one had really spoken about it. You know, I was sending them to my parents in the morning. I was like, Dad, check out this cool engineer. Mom, I found out this really great person. She used to work like you do. And everyone was like, that's very sweet, Jess. It's great that you're doing it. And then this person from The Guardian came in, and everything went crazy. Within about two weeks, it was all anyone wanted to talk about. How can we make the internet less sexist? How can we change things? How can we better celebrate these people who for so long haven't been recognized for the things that they're doing? And, and it's been really inspirational. And we've had a whole bunch of, oh, yeah, this is what I want to tell you. Even the Daily Mail covered it. Pretty cool. <laughs> That didn't, that didn't open me up to a huge number of nice comments. But, but since then, we've had, we've had editathons all over the world. We've had them in so many different countries. People have been translating the pages that I've made about scientists and engineers into all different languages. It's been absolutely incredible and inspirational. And I've had so many excited emails from people, particularly alumni of Imperial, who have said, this is such a great thing to do. It's free. It's effective. You know, People read this website without me having to direct them towards it. You learn so much about these inspiring people. It actually inspires and motivates you, too. You know, when I read about the story that someone's had to go from somewhere in Africa to do their PhD in England and go and set up a research group in America, every day I think, what an exciting thing that we get to keep working in this field and keep getting to do science. So it's really great for both sides of it. And all of these great emails were like, what are you going to do next? What are you going to do with all of this enthusiasm? So I set up a crowdfunding campaign at the beginning of August to get a copy of Angela Sione's Inferior into every secondary state school in the country. I actually set it up at the beginning just for girls' state schools because I thought, no one will fund, donate. It will be really embarrassing. So I'll start with 200 and see where we can go. But we made that in one night. So then within 12 days, we had enough money to get a copy of this book into every state school. They made a, oh yeah, and we're starting it in Canada and New York too. So that's going on at the moment. If you know any great Canadians or Americans, you might want to help. 
but they made a special schools edition, which I got to write the introduction for, and it got into schools yesterday. So this is the coolest things ever, right? So every single secondary science department in the whole country, if you're a state school, has a copy of this book in there now. And we're working with Angela and the publisher to develop some teaching resources so that people can talk about these issues of bias and these issues of stereotype and also the great women that you come up to in the book and that you meet. So what do I think that we can do and what do I think particularly that Imperial can do? Well, we're in luck because Imperial, Imperial is full of absolutely incredible academics who are spending all of their time trying to make the environment better for people from all different underrepresented groups. And I'm not completely naive. I don't think that Wikipedia and a crowdfunding campaign can change everything. I think it's up to people like you to better protect scientists from underrepresented groups, as well as mentoring and advocating for people from all different kinds of backgrounds. I think that you can help us. You can help all of us in this room if we're early career researchers with careers guidance and advice and nominate us for prizes. Put us forward when you're having a conference. P propose people to do experiments that you wouldn't expect they can. And as recognized by Chia Onura when she came to speak also in this space earlier this year, I think that we need to get better at recognizing our own bias. And whether that's in the way that we teach, the way that we interact with each other, or the way that we can um, think about how we collectively celebrate people, I think we really need to think about that bias that we all possess. And we, need to, and we in return, will build networks and will amplify the stories of each other, because we can do that when we have support of senior people like you. So having said all of that gloomy and miserable stuff, I don't think it's entirely true. I think it's a really, really great time to be a young woman entering the world right now. We had the highest number of women ever entering the US Congress. I find every single person in these photographs and in all of this story so inspirational and amazing every single day. It's also a great time to be a woman doctor. We have the first woman Doctor Who, who had the biggest ratings of all time, or the biggest number of people watching it. We had a Nobel Prize laureate in, women in physics and chemistry, who's a woman this year. And we had Jocelyn Bell-Burnell being recognized for her contributions to astrophysics 50 years after she discovered pulsars. And if you didn't follow this story, she won $3 million and has donated all of that $3 million to the, the research of underrepresented minority scientists in physics particularly. So I think it's a really great time. And I just want to end with the fact that every single learned society in this photograph is currently being led by a woman. And this is 2019. We have women leading the Royal Academy of Engineering, the Institute of Physics, the Royal Society of Chemistry, the Royal Society of Biology. It's a really exciting time. And I think that collectively, we can change it. So thank you so much. Thanks very much, Jeff. Thanks very much for that, Jess. I got inferior for Christmas. And um, as a hairy white male in science with a stupid beard, um, it, it gives you pause. It's, a, it's an excellent read. Um, now to move on to our next speaker, Dr. Faith Yuwadi is a research associate and immunologist at the Quick, working on B cells in malaria-driven Burkitt's lymphoma. So that's cancer, immunology, and, B and, um, and parasitology. So uh, one, one topic's not enough. She's an advocate for BME people in STEM, and for Black History Month in October, she highlighted a famous black scientist every day on Twitter and is combining forces with Jess in order to run a diversathon to promote um, black minority and ethnic experts on Wikipedia. She gained her MRes and PhD with us at the NHLI, and it's a pleasure to welcome her back. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for the lovely introduction, Mike. Um, my name's Faith Yuadia, and I'm going to be talking about um, creating racial diversity in STEM. So I thought I'd start with a simple definition of what a scientist is. Now, a scientist, which most of us would probably agree, is someone that conducts scientific research to advance knowledge in an area of interest. And I think most of us would probably agree with that Wikipedia definition. But for most of us, when you ask yourself the question, what does a scientist actually look like? We mostly think of someone like this, Albert Einstein. He's got the stereotypical trope that you would associate with a scientist. He's white, he's male, and he's, he's old. So he generally has that vibe that we associate with research. And I want to mention to you that this is constantly portrayed to us in the media. So if you look at entertainment media, the TVs and films, you'll generally find and get the vibe that science is white and male. 
So if it's Doc Brown from Back to the Future or Gross, Ross Geller from Friends, you get the vibe that well, white men basically rule science. Um, about 71.2% of um, STEM characters in our media are white, and 62.9% of these um, characters are also male. But what's sad about this is this isn't that different from the academic reality. So when you look at BME academics, you find that they're heavily underrepresented in the UK. So I thought I'd run you through some basic stats. So if you look at UK um, professors and look at them by ethnic group, you'll see that overwhelmingly um, um, professors are white, with only about eight of the circles right here at the bottom representing professors from an ethnic minority. If you look at heads of institutions, you find the stat even more shocking. Only 0.8% of our heads of institutions are from a BME background. So that represents that one circle there at the bottom. And if you take into account the impact of intersectionality, so start looking at gender in, in contra along with race, what you find is that these stats are much, much worse. If you look at um, what contracts people are employed on, so this is looking at fixed term contracts, you find that the UK academics from BME backgrounds are generally found on more fixed term contracts than their um, white academics. And consistent with this, they generally leave academia at a much more steady rate. So what I wanna basically draw to you from all this is that there seems to be an ethnicity penalty that exists in our institutions today for BME academics. And what I'm really talking about is a lack of progression. So if you look at undergraduate BME students, you'll see that we're fairly well represented. We represent about 23.9% of undergraduate students. As you progress in your career and look to your research postgraduate degrees, this starts to fall further. When you look at BME academics, this falls even further. And like I showed you before, professors are very heavily underrepresented. And when you take into account what impact this has on people's pay, and look at the ethnicity pay gap, which was recently <coughs> published for Russell Group um, Universities on the BBC, you can see that over well, over, overall, white academics out-earn any other BME academic group, and with the worst being amongst black and Arab individuals. So really what I'm trying to say to you here is that there's clearly an ethnicity pay gap um, and there's an ethnicity penalty, what can we do? And I really ask you to look at your team and think about it. Are your team, are you actually diverse? So if you're looking at your lab, your team, is there diversity in your team? If you look, does that diversity stop when you get further than your junior levels or does it continue all the way to the top? Really ask yourself, in my team, in my institution, in my faculty, in my department, do I have that diversity? And really, what can we actually do to change this? So the one thing I want people to start thinking about is really to think about their unconscious biases. So the picture that I've put here is Shamada Reed. She's a tech entrepreneur and is really known for running two amazing businesses. But she often says that she always feels that she's presumed to be far more junior than she actually is. So if she attends a meeting, she feels that she has to wear bright colors to kind of show that she's not part of the maintenance or the catering staff. And these unconscious biases really have an impact on, everyday, on people's everyday experiences. So for example, if you're recruiting someone and you're thinking, I just want someone in my team that looks like me, someone who fits in with my team, what are you really asking yourself? We know that if you have a white sounding name and you put in an application, you're far more likely to get a call back on that than if you have an um, ethnic sounding name. And that has real term con consequences for people's recruitment into jobs. So really think, how can I actually promote blind um, recruitment practices to make a change? Consistent with that, ask yourself, who is on my interview panel? Is my interview panel actually diverse? I know a lot of institutions are starting to really think about a gender requirement on their panels, but what about a BME can, um, candidate requirement? If my interview panel is far more diverse, does that make me want to join the company more as someone from a BME background? And does that make the panel pick someone who could be from much more diversity than you would expect? And the, refill, the really thing I want to point from this is that unconscious bias training really can make a difference. It's the kind of thing, once you understand what your bias is, that's when you can start to make a difference and think, how can I actually challenge this? And I know a lot of institutions are thinking about this at the staff level, but how about undergraduates and postgraduate students? The earlier that we can get people to think about their biases, the sooner we can make this change. I also want people to think about the power of a role model. So this is a campaign which I did very recently where I highlighted on Twitter every single day during Black History Month a scientist who was um, either a scientist, a clinician, or an inventor um, who was from a black background. And the key thing and the reason I did this is because although I've been in the academic system for about 10 years, 
I'd never been lectured by someone who was black, so someone that actually looked like me. And although you can be what you can't see, it is so much, so much harder. So we really need to get that image out there. So for me, knowing that someone like Faith Ozia existed, who is a malaria immunologist, and me as myself as an immunologist, and as of Monday, becoming a malaria immunologist, that really made me believe that, you know, there is there's something that I can look forward to and there is someone that I can become. And the key thing is that you can get involved in this as well. So me, along with Jeff Wade, who just spoke before me and gave an amazing talk, as well as members of Imperials One, such as um, Sarah and Redmond, are organizing this diversifon. So you can come along yourself and write Wikipedia pages from people from a um, BAME background and think, how can I get more stories shared? And as Jeff showed, there's a real impact that that can actually make. And the key thing is, we actually want to start all of this young. So I, haven't, I feel that I've mentioned that BME academics are fairly well represented at undergraduate level. But actually, when you look at top institutions, that's where you're getting a lower level of recruitment. So for example, this is an event that I went, which was organized by Sunday Popa Ola, so Dr. Sunday Popa Ola, who's in this room somewhere. And it was trying to get BME students to come into Imperial and basically learn that science at an institution like Imperial is somewhere that they can actually belong. So they did some experiments, they planned experiments, they built some bridges, and it was just really fun and entertaining to hear young boys tell me, I want to be an engineer, and if that doesn't work out, I'll be a footballer. But it was great. <laughs> and the key thing, as I want to tell you, is that being the outreach, it really does work. Because me as myself, I didn't apply for Imperial, and I didn't apply for UCL. I went to a great university, don't get me wrong. But the thing is, the reason I didn't apply is because I felt that it wasn't somewhere that someone like me could belong. But actually, realistically, I had the grades to get in. And the key thing is I want people to think about being the mentoring schemes as well, because they really have the power to change. You can take a student who's, um, who, to come into the school, talk to them, and let them know that this is a place that they can belong. And I really want to point out the fact that anyone can get involved in this. Because I think the biggest thing that you find is that the burden of pushing change often falls in the hands of people from the underrepresented group. So me, myself, as a black academic, comes in, finishes my PhD, and feels that I have to push the change to help the next generation after me. But realistically, to push this change, we can all help. It takes multiple hands to make this work. So I really just ask you to be an ally. What I want you to do is continue attending events like this. Learn about what you can actually do. The more you educate yourself about the issues that are out there, and the more that we talk about race as an issue, the more that we can start to make change. I also want you to ask yourself, what can I do personally to elevate a BME academic? When you look at the people that you are mentoring, are you mentoring someone from a BME background? Can you mentor someone from a BME background? I know that some universities run programs specifically push this to help more senior academics mentor people from much junior roles. Is that something you can get involved in? And also think about who you're inviting to your talks. Are your speakers pulling on the same pools that you always pull on, or are you going to much more varied pools? Who's on your panel? And the most this important point, that if you are recruiting and you have two candidates and they have a similar CV, why not think about picking the BME candidate? Simply from the fact, what other diversity of thoughts and ideas can they bring to my team? Because generally, as we know, diverse teams are much more productive and we can promote and support this BME um, academics through their careers. And the last thing I really want to draw on is from a whole institutional level. So this thing called the Race Equality Charter has just been started with the idea that we can start to um, understand how we can improve representation, progression, and the success of minority staff and students. And the key thing is that universities join this charter, which I know that Imperial has done. They start to track this data and start thinking about how they can actually put in change that can help. But I think the key thing that I urge senior people in this room to think about is, this isn't just a tip box exercise. Let's please take this seriously. It's not just something that we say, our institution, as a sign that we're a great place. Let's take it seriously to admit so we can actually make change. Because what this really calls is for a whole institutional shift in how we view the issue of race. And the key thing is that although I've grouped together BMEs as one group, there's multiple groups underneath that, and we all face different challenges. So we have to think about how we can approach that as well. And I've mostly focused on staff in this talk, but really, there's also a massive problem in students. We know that there's a massive attainment gap between BME students versus white students in their ability to attain a first and a second class degree. And the key thing is we don't still know why that is, and we know it's not because of the entry level when they come in. So there's something going on in our universities. So I just want to summarize that there's a lot that we can do at the individual level, but also at the institutional level. 
I ask you to continue attending events like this. Educate yourself. Check your bias, like I said. What is your bias and what can you do to change that? Think about role modeling. Come along to our Diversifon. Think, can I do some school outreach? Become an ally. Does that mean that you need to invite different people, mentor different people, but also who is on your interview panel? And as an institutional level, let's think, how can we support individuals who are promoting initiatives that can diversify STEM? What policy change can we do to promote diversity and inclusion? And can we, as a whole university, think about blinded or more diverse interview policies? And I think the key thing is to not do this from a top-heavy point of view. Listen to your BME staff and think, what do they think is important so that it's not from a top looking down and trying to push change on us? And lastly, let's really take this race equality stance seriously. Because the key thing is BME academics, they are increasing. So BME um, UK academic staff, we are increasing over the last couple of years. And we know that there are more and more students obtaining good degrees from a BME background. But the key thing is this is really, really slow change. So we really need to try and work to accelerate this further. And I put this last slide. And if you're from Imperial, you might recognize a lot of the faces here. And the key thing is these are academics from Imperial. And I've obviously had to cherry pick these pictures to try and create this level of diversity. But I want to get us to the point where essentially you can look at any team at Imperial and you have this level of diversity. So thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Faith. Um, and now we move on to our final speaker. Um, so we are, um, I'm very pleased to, to, to welcome Sienna Castellon, who is a 16-year-old nationally recognized neurodiversity advocate and anti-bullying campaigner. She's autistic, dyslexic, and dyspraxic, and she also has ADHD. When she was 13, she created qlmentoring.com, a website for peer-to-peer -peer mentoring of uh, neurodiverse students. Sienna is also the student representative of the NHLI's To Empower UK project, works as a peer outreach worker for the Mayor of London, and is a work placement student at UCL's Centre for Autism in Research and Education. She has received many national awards for her website and neurodiversity advocacy, including being bestowed with the British Citizen Youth Award, the Points of Light Award from Prime Minister Theresa May, and the Diana Award. Recently won the BBC Radio 1 Teen Hero Award as well. She's currently in year 12 and plans to study maths and physics at university. And I think uh, you'd all agree that we'd hope that Imperial might be on her list of places to consider. Um, welcome, Sienna. Neurodiversity is based on the premise that there's a natural biological variation in the neurocognitive functioning of human brains and minds. Our brains are wired differently, which gives us different abilities. Yet much too frequently, society sees different as being inferior, less desirable, and abnormal. In many ways, the neurodiverse community has a lot in common with other marginalized groups who have fought against societal constructs of what is normal and who have fought for equality and acceptance. One fifth of the population is neurodiverse. This is a conservative figure. The number is believed to be much higher, especially in relation to autistic women and women with ADHD. The neurodiverse population makes up a considerable percentage of the general population, which is why it is important to begin to develop and harness our many strengths and talents. As you can see from this list, Many of our strengths and abilities are ideally suited for careers in STEM. Strengths such as problem-solving abilities, our logical and analytical ways of thinking, creativity and innovative approaches. Some organizations are already recognizing that neurodiverse individuals are particularly well suited to STEM. For example, 50% of NASA scientists are dyslexic. NASA actively hires dyslexic scientists because of their aptitude for pattern recognition. More and more, organizations are beginning to recognize the unique strengths and abilities that come from perceiving the world differently. Many are beginning to expand their definition of diversity to not only include gender, equality, and race, but also neurodiversity. Yet there are still significant hurdles to overcome. There is still a, sig a stigma and many misconceptions and stereotypes in relation to what it means to have a learning difference 
or what it means to be autistic. We are often perceived as being stupid or less capable. Our primary and secondary education system is generally a hostile environment for us. It frequently leaves us behind or discards us. Most teachers receive no training on how to support neurodiverse students. Worse yet, school senkos, the individuals responsible for supporting neurodiverse students, receive little or no training on dyslexia, dyspraxia, ADHD, and autism. All that it is required to be a teacher or to become a senko is an afternoon introduction session that focuses on how to fill out the paperwork for extra time and on national exams. I have had senkos tell me that everyone is a little autistic. I have had a senko tell me that I could not be dyslexic because I could read. I have had senkos miss my autism despite all the red flags. Instead, they viewed me as shy, reserved, and as a loner, an eccentric, quirky, and odd, as the person to blame for being bullied because I was different and did not make the effort to fit in. In an era of austerity, support services for neurodiverse students have been decimated. The barriers to academic success for neurodiverse students are so great that many neurodiverse students are unable to compensate for the obstacle caused by their learning differences and are therefore unable to fulfill their academic potential. Furthermore, our national exam-based education system is rigged against neurodiverse students. The national exams assess us on our deficits and disregard many of our strengths. The exams do not test creativity or ingenuity, innovation or resilience. Instead, the national exams test how well you can memorize mark schemes and parrot information. Since neurodiverse students do not think or learn this way, many bright and talented neurodiverse students do not get the GCSEs or A-level grades that are needed to continue their education. As a consequence, the scientific community is losing many talented neurodiverse youth who have the potential to be talented, successful scientists, but who have been let down by a system that does not value them. The fact that there is little to no support for neurodiverse students inspired me to change this. When I was 13, I created a website, QR Mentoring, to mentor and support neurodiverse students. I created the website because most schools do not support us and because all the online resources I found when researching my various learning differences were aimed at parents. On my website, I share the tips and tricks I have used to overcome and compensate for the obstacles caused by my learning differences. I also provide advice on bullying. 75% of autistic students and 70% of students with learning differences report being bullied. The greatest threat to my education has been bullying. I have been bullied at school for most of my life. I was forced to leave Cheltenham Ladies College and Seven Oaks School, where I was an academic scholar, because of severe bullying. So in addition to having to overcome for the academic differences caused by our learning difference, we also have to endure relentless abuse, intolerance, and disdain from other students, and sometimes even teachers. I have met dozens of neurodiverse students who were driven out of school because of bullying. There are currently thousands of neurodiverse students who are being deprived of an education. For the avoidance of doubt, access to an education is a human right. Yet, in the UK, this human right is not extended to neurodiverse students. This may be a controversial thing to say, but in many ways, neurodiverse brains are better suited to STEM than neurotypical brains. For example, let's compare two different brains, the neurotypical brain and the autistic brain. The neurotypical brain is optimally designed to facilitate socialization. It is designed for collaboration, interaction, and social communication. It allows neurotypicals to read body language, understand facial expressions, to pick up on subtle fluctuations in tone of voice, understand different points of view, and other forms of complex social communication, such as political maneuvering and the politics of social hierarchies. On the other hand, the autistic brain is optimally designed to examine the physical world in much greater detail. The autistic brain is not designed for collaboration, interaction, and social communication. On the contrary, it is designed to be independent, objective, and to be an outsider. It gives autistics the ability to be highly logical, rational, and analytical. It gives us the ability to be systematic, 
to recognize patterns and to develop deep areas of expertise. We are not swayed by societal norms or pressures. We are loners who march to the beat of our own drums. This allows us to go where science lead, leads us, free of the baggage of societal norms and pressures. It is thought that some of the most famous scientists were autistic. Scientists like Henry Cavendish, Charles Darwin, and Sir Isaac Newton. Many people also believe that Einstein and Steve Jobs were autistic, and that some of our current titans of technology, such as Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg, are autistic. In fact, it is estimated that over 50% of individuals working in the tech industry in Silicon Valley are autistic. In the general population, that figure is 1%. Objectively, the autistic brain is optimally designed for STEM, yet both brains serve a very different and important purpose. The neurotypical brain is optimally designed to facilitate the development of communities and civilizations and to collectively coordinate human behavior, whereas the autistic brain is optimally designed to allow us to analyze and systemize and to discern details and patterns that enable human beings to understand how the world around us works. Neither is better or worse. Both complement each other and balance each other out. Both are equally important. In order to embrace neurodiverse talent, we need to discard the notion of normal and move towards a paradigm of inclusion, diversity, and equality. We need to move away from models that require neurodiverse students to adapt and conform to a one-size-fits-all neurotypical model. In particular, schools and universities need to begin to recognize the unique strengths and abilities of their neurodiverse students and shift their focus towards harnessing these strengths and abilities. This will require them to adapt their teaching methods and to stop assessing and evaluating neurodiverse students on neurotypical skill sets. I am very passionate to be about being the student representative of To Empower, a project started by Professor Sarah Rankin to address the lack of support available to twice exceptional students, high ability students who are also neurodiverse. In the United States, there are lots of academic programs and schools specifically designed for TUI students. I have been fortunate in that I have benefited from some of these programs. <coughs> Since the age of 10, I have attended advanced physics and math programs, such as Stanford University's Pre-Collegiate Summer Institutes and John Hopkins University Center for Talented Youth. Last summer, I studied theoretical physics at Perimeter Institute in Canada. Although these programs are not specifically for neurodiverse students, a majority of the students who attend these programs are neurodiverse. These programs are transformative because TUI students are taught challenging subject matter not typically taught in primary and secondary school, but also because it is the only place where I felt I belonged, the only place where I wasn't a freak or weird where I could openly embrace my love of physics and math. If we are going to succeed in harnessing the talents of neurodiverse students, UK universities will need to create programs such as To Empower, programs that recognize the unique strengths and abilities of neurodiverse students and aim to, to help them in achieving their STEM potential. There are many simple steps that teachers can take that will make a monumental difference to dyslexic students. Although this sub this, the, sub um, the suggestions on this slide may seem trivial and pedantic, these seemingly insignificant steps can make a difference between a student in your class excelling or failing. There is nothing more frustrating than being set up to fail. The only time I have truly felt disabled is when I'm being taught by a teacher whose teaching style relies on all the deficits caused by my dyslexia, dyspraxia, ADHD, and autism, some of which I have listed on this slide. There are simple steps that you can take. Don't ask dyslexic students to read aloud. Trust me when I say it's mortifying and it's a soul-destroying experience. Don't penalize us on our atrocious spelling, especially when spelling scientific terms. Don't expect us to accurately copy things down from a board, especially a whiteboard. I am unable to discern black writing against a glaring, glossy white surface, let alone read it and copy it down accurately. I often get maths problems to do in class that have B and D variables. 
Since I confuse the two letters, I have to replace them with different variables, such as an X and a Y. Sometimes, in the haste to finish, I forget to convert them back or simply run out of time. My teachers are then baffled as to how I manage to introduce an X and a Y into my calculations. Your dyslexic students are having to make dozens of adjustments to compensate for the obstacles their learning differences cause. It is a constant battle, and it is exhausting. You have the power to make their life so much harder or so much easier. Ask yourself what type of teacher you want to be. In order to support autistic students, it is important that you try to step into their shoes. Since the basis of our disability is social communication skills, avoid assigning us group work. By assessing us on teamwork and collaboration, you are setting us up to fail. Remember that we work best alone. Requiring us to work in groups means that our attention is focused on trying to understand the social dynamics of the group instead of the task at hand. Be conscious of sensory processing issues that can cause autistic students discomfort or pain, such as fluorescent lights, noises, and smells. I recently had to do a physics experiment that involved measuring sound. There were dozens of students whistling, which is a sensory nightmare for someone like me who has extremely sensitive hearing. Communicate any changes in schedule or routine well in advance because autistic students need time to mentally prepare. Consider whether your assessment criteria are discriminatory. I'm not going to discuss assessing us on collaboration and communication because we'll be here all day, but I'd like to give you a specific example. I go to a specialist math school and was recently assessed on my love of learning. As you can see, I received an amber in relation to my love of learning. One of the criteria that determines whether I have a love of learning is whether in lessons I actively participate in all tasks with enthusiasm. One of the main characteristics of autism, especially in, in women, is, is what is often referred to as a robotic demeanor and a perceived lack of emotion. We have a flat affect, limited facial expression, and monotone voice. In other words, we don't wear our emotions on our sleeves, and we don't show emotion in conventional ways. However, that does not mean that we do not have emotion. We feel things deeply. How is enthusiasm determined? I suspect it is based on facial expressions and body language and emotional responses, based on being visibly excited and behaving in a certain way, such as uncontrollably blurting out answers in class. In other words, what is perceived as indicators of enthusiasm are neurotypical conventions that are not necessarily an accurate indication. For the avoidance of doubt, I am very enthusiastic about my learning. I do every extension problem I'm given, even if it means staying up till 3 a.m. I have read the course textbook at least five times and have read the textbook cited in the course textbook as well. I often stay in the library past midnight, reading physics and maths books and extending my knowledge for my own pleasure. I've spent every summer since I was 10 studying math and physics. I am currently in the progress, process of applying to several six-week math summer programs, including two at MIT. As you can probably gather, maths and physics are my autistic special interests. My passion for STEM is one of the reasons I am here speaking to you today, and yet, in my school report, I have an amber to alert me to the fact that I do not demonstrate conventional, neurotypical love of learning for a subject that I love. Needless to say, it is incredibly soul-destroying and demoralizing to be perceived by my maths and physics teachers as someone who is not enthusiastic about a subject I live and breathe, a subject I have devoted myself to for over half my life. There is much work to be done to improve the understanding of neurodiverse students, which is why I recently launched a school campaign to change negative perceptions about students with learning differences. The campaign aims to have schools in the UK shift from focusing only on our challenges to also recognizing and celebrating the strengths of their neurodiverse students. The campaign is supported by 16 major charities and currently has 42 schools participating which amounts to over, over 36,000 students. Thank you very much for coming to this event. 
If you would like to ask me any questions or speak to me after the talk, please feel free to do so. Thanks so much, Sina, for that. And if we could um, invite the other speakers back up as well. We give them all a round of applause um, for those uh, fascinating and illuminating talks. Um, thank you very much. Want to sit down or do you want to stand up? Grab a seat. We've got three, we've got three seats, so we might as well use them. Um, uh, we've got some time for some questions from the audience, and we've got roving microphones, which I can't see. Um, oh, there we go. There's one there. So indicate very clearly um, against this background if uh, you'd like to ask a question of any of our speakers or all three. Anyone going to kick us off? Uh, one right at the back there. If you could just wait for the microphone so we can hear you. Hi, thank you to all the speakers. I was wondering uh, with the last speaker, what helped you or allowed you to break the barriers that you were facing? Um, for me, it was really understanding my learning differences. So before I was diagnosed and before I was able to get the support I needed, I had a lot of problems just in not really getting why I was ha having like issues in class. Like with my dyslexia, I didn't understand why I was having issues with spelling. But then once I was diagnosed, I was able to learn about how my difference affected me and ask for those reasonable adjustments. And it really helps when your school is supportive. So I guess you needed to have a supportive school though to manage to get yeah, through the challenges, right? Definitely. If your school kind of helps you with group work, or helps you with like your assignments and managing that with dyspraxia, it can really make your school experience so much easier. Thank you very much. There was another one slightly further down towards the middle. Oh, Stephen. Uh, hi, I'm Stephen Curry. I'm the Assistant Provost for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. I, I almost feel obliged to ask a question, but uh, <laughs> I want to thank all three speakers for what were really inspiring and provocative and evidence-based talks, which is exactly the sort of thing I think you might get. College. Um, I've also read In Theory and think it's a really fantastic book, but uh, the book I was reading myself over Christmas was written by Margaret Heffernan, who studied how organizations work and how they become more productive and makes a point about group work and collaboration being really important, far more than competition between individuals. And I was interested in what Sienna was saying about the experience of neurodiverse uh, people whereby they don't want universities to submit them, subject them to group work because it's not an environment in which you will necessarily thrive. You like to work independently. But is that necessarily the best preparation for life in the future? Or is it that neurodiverse people will um, thrive best in a career which allows them then to work in an independent method? Given that um, a lot of the research that's going on shows that productive teams are themselves very diverse in many different ways. They need men and women and they need minority perspectives as well, uh, and actually they particularly benefit from having people who can read the room, which is, um, uh, I guess, a more normal level of neurodiverse um, uh, um, attribute. Yeah. Sorry, Mike, could you just summarize the question for us? <laughs> 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 so, oh, uh, <laughs> did you, sorry, did I don't you <laughs> So the question was really about uh, the, the interesting point that Sienna made about um, neurodiverse people thriving best when they're given independent tasks and was asking universities to take that into account. Now, in um, the world beyond university, then, of course, many organizations rely on teams to collaborate, and research would suggest that the best, the most, uh, the most effective teams are those that are themselves diverse, bring different perspectives, and include people who not just are bright, but who can read the room, as it were. And I was just wanting to explore what your, whether you thought this um, sort of activity was something that was a skill that neuro neurodiverse people could develop, or whether it was something that, you know, we simply, something that has to be lived with and accommodated. Yeah, well... <laughs> In particular with autism, it's a social communication and interaction disorder. So no amount of kind of group work that you're forcing them into will kind of fix that. But 
um, I find that you need to have a balance. So in university, if you are doing all this team-based flip book learning, you need to also put in some lectures or just have that kind of balance, especially in secondary school as well. You can't have all group work because if you're not supporting your autistic students and helping them with that group work, helping them kind of with the management, with the politics of like this, those social situations, it be can become incredibly stressful and it can put them off. Thank you. But also both of Faith and I noticed on your slide about mm. famous people who had um, yeah. differences in learning. They were all pretty much white old men or white men. Yeah. So maybe it is a, a underdiagnosis, particularly of women in senior positions who might have it. So we just don't know whether diverse people in those teams can do it because it's underdiagnosed in women, right? Yeah, definitely. It's really underdiagnosed because of like the stigma and the um, diagnosis there. Any other questions? We've got one just here. Great talk from all three of you. Um, I had a question about, it's great to see so many people have kind of attended and taken an interest in diversity in STEM, but what do you do when you have people who are kind of on the flip side of that, who don't see it as a problem, who, who refuse to acknowledge it? How do you tackle that? And how do you think you can engage those kinds of people into the work that you do? I think um, exactly with what Stephen said before, by emphasizing how much more productive and successful teams are when they are diverse, that's something generally everyone wants to publish papers and receive big research grants. And if you show them that you're much more likely to do that if you have a diverse team, then, then hopefully people come on board with it. I think there's another side to um, talking about this very openly too, and you probably experienced this a bit with the tweet thread, yeah. but that people push back and call you names and are very yeah. horrible. But um, in general, you're never going to make those people happy. And, and Emma Chapman, who's a phenomenal campaigner to end sexual harassment, who's an astrophysicist here at Imperial, just after all of that stuff with The Guardian went really, really crazy, I was getting all of these horrible messages and horrible tweets and really horrible people were online saying nasty things about me. And she made me this little crochet, beautiful little thing that said, thou shall not read the comments. And I've now got to have this beside my bed because after the, even just after that Daily Mail article, people send you such nasty things. So I think really you've just got to know that there's going to be trolls there that you're going to get angry. And fine, they're going to be angry, whatever. If you're making them happy, then you're definitely doing the wrong thing. So, so that's one aspect of it. But for the people that you need to engage to, to realize that this is important, I think talking like Faith and Sienna did so so well about uh, the challenges that they face, that's how they'll trust you and realize it, and then show them how much more successful teams are when they're diverse. In, in contrast <laughs> to that, I've been on Twitter for about uh, nine years, um, tens of thousands of tweets. I have never once received some sort of rude comment from anyone at all in that time. <laughs> so uh, in contrast, <laughs> and I tweet about uh, race and inclusion and diversity all the time. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there was a question just here. Yeah. Someone wrote me a letter. <laughs> Hello, I'm Tom Welton, Dean of the Faculty of Natural Sciences. And, and really addressing, us, I suppose to you, Jess, that how do you find out about all of these wonderful people when they don't already have Wikipedia pages? I'm a really good and, researcher. And, and, yeah. <laughs> How, how would we go about finding out about these people that don't already have Wikipedia pages? And particularly people where their diversity characteristic, if you like, is not visibly obvious. That's something that's really hard and it's also something that I'm quite cautious to um, talk about. Actually, probably you did this in the thread as well when you were made, putting together all these people from different backgrounds. I mean, skin colour is relatively easy, gender is usually okay. and. And that's something that you can find quite easily when you're trying to pull statistics from Wikipedia. But to particularly trying to, um, you know, I want to make pages about LGBTQ scientists. It's very hard to find whether they're out and whether they're openly out and they want people to know about that. There's a great platform now called 500 Queer Scientists. So there's 500 women scientists and 500 queer scientists. And so generally, if they're on that website, I'm pretty sure they're okay being public knowledge that they're a queer scientist. So, so Wikipedia's criteria, if you've kind of spoken about it in a public place, if a newspaper article talks about it, something on your university page, if you're on that site. So generally, that's okay. If, that, if the line is ever shadowy, I contact them and ask them. And, and if I'm researching people who are um, alive, I can do quite a lot of research quite quickly. 
if they're historical, you have to get kind of archived content. But people are generally so excited about it, about, about contributing to Wikipedia. You know, the reason I started doing it was because my friend works at the Welcome Collection as a Wikimedian in residence, getting the archived content from the Welcome onto Wikipedia because so much more, many more people go on Wikipedia than they do the Welcome website. It's a really great way to open access to all of your resources. And so, so many people have been emailing me since all of this, this hype to say, can we, can we contribute? You can have journal access to this. We'll send you all of these archived things. So I think really finding the information is really, really easy. It's finding the time to be able to sort through that information that's hard. And now so many people write to me and ask me to make their Wikipedia pages. <laughs> I think we've got time for one last question. We've run over just a little bit. Uh, any final question? No, in which case, uh, Professor Childers, if you'd like to come down. So, uh, distinguished guests, uh, provost, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure as the head of this department uh, just to say a few words of gratitude to our three wonderful speakers tonight. Um, uh, I have been challenged, I have been educated, and I've been stimulated to go and do things better and differently, and I hope... Uh, you all have too. Um, we have had three incredible talks from three very brave and very inspirational people. Uh, drinks are at the back, and I just want on your behalf to thank them. Before we have a final round of applause, however, I do want to say a particular thank you to our Athena Swan team in the department. Up until about 60 minutes ago, I thought that we were doing things reasonably well. We had an Athena Swan silver, hey ho, what could be wrong with that? <laughs> I'm now less certain, but we're doing things quite as well. But I hope we can get things even better. But Sarah, a huge thank you to you and your wonderful team. Charlotte also, uh, Mike, for chairing this so well. And uh, thank you again to our three wonderful speakers. I really appreciate it. And refreshments outside for everybody who's come. And thank you for your support.